Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Plotlines. I'm your host, Connor. And with me today is Robert Nugent from De- uh, De- what is it? Uh, De- I can't. Decrevy. Decrevy, Decrevy. determined to be Catholic. I can't believe I messed That's... that up this time. Uh, <laughs> um, thank you for coming on. He, he is a YouTuber and he is very successful at what he does. Yeah. Well, Connor, no, I, thanks very much for having me on. I've been uh, following your work for a number of weeks and the different interviews. Um, in, coincidentally, on the line, The Witch in the Wardrobe, I was reading uh, the the Narnia Code uh, and I saw your episode there. I was fascinated to see the content you're putting out and more power to you. Uh, it's great to see a new generation of, um, of men that love the faith uh, trying to lead. And uh, yeah, so anything I can do to help, uh, I'm I'm here. Thank you. Uh, I really enjoyed your episode with Theodore Charles Murr. I think that's yeah. his name, right? Uh, yes, yes. He, he, that was such, it's such an interesting topic. Uh, and to think that, you know, there's just this priest that experienced all, all this like, uh, sort of drama within the, uh, within the Holy See, it leading up to the death of, uh, Paul the Sixth and stuff yeah. like that is just wild to me. And it's and it's amazing because you hear these. Uh, I've heard a lot of those stories before, and you always think, "Oh, these are conspiracy." But like so many people saying the same things, but a different um, a different side to their their experiences. Um, you you definitely um, there's definitely more to the story. Uh, people try to brush it away as conspiracy, but uh, I I really don't think we're dealing with that. I think you're. Where there ever there are human beings, you will always find the good and the bad, and uh, and the Vatican is no different. Uh, I can say that from experience. Yeah. So we're going to be talking about Ireland and its uh, uh, tumultuous relationship with the faith right now. But before yeah. we start, uh, please, if you like what we're doing here at Plotlines, like, share, and subscribe, comment, and join our Discord to join the conversation or continue the conversation off air word from our affiliate bishop sheen rosaries you've probably worn through the chain of your cheap plastic rosary other rosaries simply can't stand up to the wear and tear of everyday life bishop sheen rosaries are made of solid metal beads and paracord to withstand any condition and are backed with a lifetime warranty upgrade your rosary to a Bishop Sheen rosary made to fit your lifestyle or buy one for a friend. Each rosary sold supplies two weeks of food for a school kid in Uganda. You use the exclusive link down below to help support our efforts here at Plotlines. The link will take you to sheenrosaries.com. Be sure to use the code PLOTLINES10. So, um, but yeah, so you are, what part of Ireland are, are you from? So I'm from, I was born in Dublin. Um, we were living in a, in a county called Wicklow in a town called Avoca. There's no hospital nearby. So my, my, my mom gave birth to me in Dublin. Uh, so that's where I was baptized in a, in a little town called Avoca. And several years later, it became a very, very famous because they had a, a, a TV series. They are called Balakas Angels. And uh, so that's how that little town became famous. But my father worked in, um, in in the mines in the town and we also owned the only supermarket in the town and uh, we owned the old army barracks in the town. So uh, three different, we, my dad was working in two different jobs. He, you know, uh, he, he, he became a self-made millionaire after working in oil in Canada. So he, he, he b- invested it in a lot of properties uh, back in the day, which was always a good move, but, um, yeah that that's another story um wow. uh after there we moved back to navin he was working in, in mines in navin and then he um he mo- we moved back to a place called at boy near where my father was born in yeah, between Meath and westmeath so between parishes of delvin kildaki and at boy for anyone in ireland who knows those places so really in the midlands in, in ireland in in the royal county and um 
you know, my family had lived there for centuries and centuries. So I, I'd say it meant a lot to him. And my uncle used to speak about, you know, the the the, the different Nugents uh, that had lived in that area and, you know, the, all of the different families and, and so forth, uh, because we're a Norman family that came there back in the in the well the guts of a thousand years ago really so it uh, we've been there ever since so there's a lot of history and story there but at the moment i'm living in the completely the other side of ireland on the atlantic in a town called ballina in county mayo so this is where i've been working for the last 21 years um and raised the family here have three kids and a beautiful wife from poland so um uh that that's that's my short story at the moment okay uh, it does it make make you annoyed when uh Americans refer to themselves as Irish because of heritage? Um, no, because we, you know, we would acknowledge our French heritage. You know, we came from our family came from France, and that was a long time ago. Um, no, no, I think it's 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 good to to know where you come from, to know your roots, and. Uh, it's it's interesting the connections and so forth. Although every American president has to find an Irish connection, it seems so like <laughs> they even named uh, the Obama Plaza here in Ireland. Somehow he managed to have some Irish connection, which I found fascinating. But uh, yeah, it's, interesting. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, yeah, that's that's wild. Uh, I have some County Mayo heritage myself. So okay, yeah, um, but that. When you come over here, we'll we'll hook you up with your long lost cousins. <laughs> yeah, I don't, uh, uh, no idea if, how many people are st- like are still in Ireland and stuff like that. Yeah. But um, so yeah, that's interesting. Uh, but yeah, so I mean, with a name like McHugh, it just uh, it uh, you know, it screams Irish. It and does uh, I even have a friend, with the, uh, another friend with the last name Nugent. So uh, okay. Uh, so maybe a relative uh, uh he always says that they got kicked out of uh france yeah. is that uh that's true yes okay but the nor the the the, the nor they were sent over the the english king sent them over to ireland to get to, to get rid of the normans so yeah hmm. we, we were moved around a little bit okay and he i think he said that they got then move moved back to france when uh i think around like during the reformation and stuff like that and then got kicked out again by the french it, king yeah it there's a there are different families so there's uh-huh. different uh, there's different um strands different families in the that would have moved around different areas so uh, you'd have gotcha. to go way back to to, to 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 unite us all yeah um but yeah so the ireland is kind of a mess with the faith right now is it not yeah well, I suppose it's I, I don't like being too negative, but uh, for, for us Catholics, the wake up call was we had two referendums in the last number of years, one for um, same sex marriage and then the other for abortion uh, in that sequence. And I, I think people didn't think too much about the first referendum, but when the second referendum passed at such a large um Gap majority, you know, sixty six percent of the of the voting of those who voted, even though uh, there wasn't the massive turnout they expected, but sixty six percent of those who did vote voted okay. against abortion, and you were really looking at of a population of you, know, you mean for million. abortion, yeah, for abortion, voted for abortion, the the majority voted for abortion, so uh, you were left the number of people that voted against this proposal that that voted. That were voting no for the proposal, for for abortion on demand, it was about seven hundred thousand uh, people on the island on the in the republic, um, and that was kind of the uh, the massive uh, wake up call that really, uh, if we cannot defend the the child in the womb, cannot have an on, honest conversation about the child in the womb and the value of a child in the womb as we really it goes to show where the church had 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 fallen so um it's quite it's quite incredible because when we think about it uh, that was 2018 18 it was june 2018 in 2019 we had exactly 6660 
6,666 abortions. You know, I mean, we, we always re- we all remember those headlines. I think many, many journalists, you know, they were saying, oh, it's over 6,500 abortions. You know, they were trying to play with the numbers because saying the numbers 6,666 abortions, you know, kind of jarred with some people with that, that that's a very significant number and has lots of connotations uh, and so forth. And uh, immediately after that figure was public, published, because that that came out in 2020, you know, we had the, the you know, we all remember the Pachamama stuff and then the, the COVID uh, crisis kicking in, which, you know, our restrictions lasted for exactly six, 666 days and six oh. hours. Oh, wow. And so. Yeah, it was kind of freaky. I, it, I I couldn't believe it until I actually looked at the dates and was announced in the dates that ended, and it was uh, it was uh, quite interesting. And um, during COVID, uh, we really saw who had faith and who didn't in, in in the Irish Church. You know, they they were very very quick to close churches, which is understandable. You know, if you were thinking in March twenty twenty, okay, let's let's let's. Um, Let's be prudent and err on the side of caution and and see what happens. So we, I think worldwide, this was the same approach. Let's shut down, you know, high and uh, isolate and, um, and restrict movement. But as things progressed and we saw countries like Sweden and Europe, which never closed their churches, um, and, I, and I would have gone to mass in, uh, in the parish of Christ the King in, um, in Gothenburg, no, knowing, and I was following them online and saying, oh, "Look, they're they're able to have mass all during the lockdown," <laughs> and yet, and yet, in in Ireland, um, you know, the the, the bishops were extremely afraid, um, and they shut their churches, and that went on for a good while. So, in July, uh, twenty twenty, when our government said, "Now you can open churches and have spaced out masses," you know, uh, every, you know. T- keep two meters apart and reduce capacity in our local parish when we could legally have mass our our parish priest and the association of catholic priests in ireland they asked for more time to implement these covid guidelines so they wanted a few more weeks even though they were legally allowed to say mass (laughs) they decided it was it was quite quite incredible and and to put it in context you know we, we a lot of laity were all working 12 hour shifts or eight hour shifts in, 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 in factories around Ireland, you know, the Guinness factories were still working in the potato chip factories and the fast food industry and restaurants, you know, there was a lot of people working side by side with others all during this pandemic. And yet for some reason, the, the church went all out to make sure that they were rendering themselves non-essential. Yeah. That you can go. Yeah. And yeah. in, in America, it's was never uh, legally, you know, like the church never was forced to close. It it forced itself to close the entire time, yeah. and it, it just baffled me. You know, I I thought when when COVID hit, I thought, okay, well, this is going to, you know, like I I just didn't think, okay, things that are protected by law will get shut down. Will won't get shut down because that they can't do that. So, uh, and to me, you know, essentials just screams the church and everything else seems, you know, not, not essential in any capacity. So if you can't feed your soul, you know, the body is going to collapse as well. Yeah. So it, yeah. it's just baffling to me. And I mean, it makes sense in other countries like Ireland where the government is re- was literally doing the one forcing but it, it baffles me in places where that's not even the case where nothing had to be, nothing was forced. It was just voluntary. Yeah. I mean, in Poland, my wife's in Poland, they never shut their churches. They just put on more masses. And so they had socially distant masses, but they were offering more masses and uh, Poland didn't collapse. Their economy didn't collapse. Their population wasn't decimated by COVID. So we can give we can give them a pass for say April, say March, April, two months, you know, because I think you know everybody was trying to see where it was going. But after, you know, June after after June twenty twenty, it became clear, you know, that it, this wasn't destroying, uh, you know, countries and communities and so forth. And and if people wanted to go to mass, there should have been the possibility. And if you didn't want to go to mass and you were a bit afraid, okay, we'll stay at home. Um, but um, 
it, it was it was a kind of a strange it was a strange uh, two years and mm-hmm. and all during that time that's when i started um blogging so i, I started this channel after the pachamama stuff and uh father mitch paqua on e- ewtn i remember him saying and he's a very measured jesuit he isn't one of these extreme traditional jesuits he's he's kind of a measured uh personality in the church are there extreme uh traditional jesuits you would be surprised. Okay. You would be surprised. Uh, I, I, I can't say much because I know a few of them. But <laughs> you, would be, you would be surprised at, uh, at at the Jesuits. They're they're not all on the same wave. I don't know. They're, yeah. So, uh, but M- M- Mitch Packer, you could say, okay, this guy isn't really. He's never been that controversial. He's a biblical scholar, and when he started saying this was a major scandal, what was happening in the Vatican, that's when I started you know, just thinking about the faith uh, a little bit more seriously, because, you know, my journey has been, you know, a seminarian for nine years, then, you know, leaving, starting a family, leaving, you know, really just drawing myself away from the faith, really not taking that seriously, and then coming back to the faith and, uh, and really looking at my, the next generation of Catholics, you know, uh, because we, I, you often take it for granted, but when you see it disappearing, even they've said, look, it's you always know it's there and you can return to it. But when you see when you when you go back and you see, OK, well, what I held sacred is no longer there. That's when you have to ask, is this true and is this real? And uh, how serious am I going to take my faith and how can I pass this to the next generation? So that's really where you know, the shock started to set in. Um, and uh, what Ireland is witnessing now is the is this is the second dissolution of the monastery so when henry the eighth came into ireland and closed monasteries and churches and so forth you know he did that by force now we're facing the exact same purge in the church you know we're seeing the closure of monasteries and convents and communities and churches and the downsizing because that's what the church will face over the next 30 years is church closers church closures that's that's there there's no other escape because unless you're going to uh you know change course which irish bishops don't seem to be able to do at the moment they they you know it's a sign of madness to continue to do the same thing over and over again expecting different results it's not going to it's not going to work um and uh you know because i i I put my children through catholic school education and it's exactly what i got in the 1980s no change no nothing it's exactly the same and i said well look you gave a fairy faith formation that has destroyed the faith in the whole generation and now we're doing it you're doing it the same yes do it again do it again (laughs) My daughter, because my daughter knows how much I love the faith and she would have my my daughter, Laura, she would she would um, show me what they're teaching her in her um, Catholic school. And I'm just there. God, like it's it's it's, uh, you know, you're just setting people up really to to leave the church the way the faith has been taught, because it's it's purely academic. There is no prayer. There is no one. There is no encouragement in the sacraments. You know, you're not encountering Christ. Uh, in his most real form and uh, you know it's it's completely turned into a kind of a philosophical intellectual thing that you know some people might engage with and others don't but that's that's really where we have gone in the church I mean I I, I was brought up in a in a in a in a what was called the convent of mercy it was run by nuns in the 1980s but the religious side the religious formation was done by a laywoman very nice lady but I mean we spent our time you know, learning about everything but religion, really. I mean, we n- never read the Bible. The catechism was never knew. This was after the catechism was actually published. Didn't know anything about that. We didn't have, you know, there was no confession. There was barely mass offered. I think there was mass offered once or twice a year. Uh, not that I remember. Wow. I'm, we went to adoration once. I remember there was once adoration offered in the five years I was there. That's kind of impressive, actually. I I uh, I would have expected adoration not even to exist. 
Yeah, well, it was it wasn't the school. It was um, <laughs> the, the, it was the 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 nun, very saintly nun. She walked into the class one day. And she said, "Look, there's adoration in the church across the road, and the people that were supposed to do adoration can't go to adoration. So look, let's all go over the class." So she marched just across the road to the parish churches. So it wasn't in the school, across and I still <laughs> I still remember that adoration. I still it was the only time that we had it. Um, uh, so yeah, that that was uh, that was our Catholic formation in in and back then, and you know there was um I it was we we there was a priest that came once to give a talk was Father Cleary, uh, he was kind of famous at the time, and later it found out that he had he had a few kids or he had one child or something like that. So, I mean, there was a lot of problems in the in in the church in 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 in, in the nineteen eighties that were kind of just bubbling along you know the under the under the water at that stage but um um there wasn't really uh, we couldn't i couldn't say there was a faith formation like all of my faith formation is in was in the seminary was really um, in latin or sorry in in spanish and italian it was outside of ireland and then Wait, you get a in in did you say so you went to seminary yes i was nine okay. years in the legionaries of christ Okay. Isn't legionaries kind of messed up? Or... Yes. Okay. <laughs> so, do you know? Do you know what? It, it, we, we we found out la- afterwards all of the messed up stuff, and um, I I left in nineteen ninety nine before um it all went public. Um, yes, it was it was a very interesting experience. But the thing that people need to understand about them, the only reason that they were able to progress and show some success in the church is what the legion used to do is they would do what the church did and just make it more reverent so they would take the novus ordo and say it in latin as reverent as you could as you could get and they would just do what the church did so anyone coming in from the outside they would say okay you're celebrating the mass reverently and it's communion kneeling on the tongue and it's all rever they they if they were doing something wildly non catholic you know people would have picked up on it there were so many men entering that had a good catholic formation so you know if if you had a man coming in there saying oh you're celebrating uh, novus ordo with some weird prayers or something like that they would have copped on they would have seen it so that was the only way Father Marcel was were able to masquerade the Legion in the church was to he plagiarized. He plagiarized spirituality and pl- which is a good thing, actually, if you think about it. Wow. You know, just do what the church does. And he was able to use the move the Legion forward in that in that way. And uh, so we did have, you know, uh, uh, we did learn the catechism. He we, we just learned as much as possible what the church does what the church teaches that that's really what they stuck to and you know the people that would have formed me they didn't know what was going on at the top so uh yeah it was a very it was a very interesting uh, experience to say the least so and it makes it makes me think of sort of a a, a corrupted opus day uh, yes o- yes opus day make that make the way you're sort of setting it up makes it sound very much like opus day but just with a hidden underbelly. Yeah, they they had serious flaws. I mean, they they made us take a vow uh, the, to not criticize our superiors. This fourth private vow, uh, which the Vatican quickly got rid of as soon <laughs> as the, as, the, as Father Marcel's um, pyramid scheme and uh, stuff got. And there were, and in some ways, it was a sect in the church. The, there was a sect mentality in there, and uh, you know, which wasn't good. And uh, yeah, it it, it it was an interesting experience. Um, uh, I didn't, ex- I can't say I had the worst experience personally. I wasn't abused, and I don't know many people personally in my generation that 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 were. We were so far removed from the founder. Sure. You know, we were never, we were never alone with him. We didn't, you know, he was, he kept his distance, and we didn't, you know, we didn't know him that much. Um, and as I said. Uh, a lot of the men that joined that seminary, they simply wouldn't have stood for what's going on in other seminaries. So like, it's not like, you know, it, when I hear the stories of what's going on in other places, I said, well, that's not what happened with us. Like it would have been unheard of for any man to enter your room, like no seminary. And it was like a given law. Nobody enters another person's room or, you know, 
you wouldn't touch anybody. It was just like, and we just said, okay, this is kind of normal stuff. But when you hear other seminaries and say, oh God, what's the, the stuff that was going on, the McCarrick yeah. report and stuff like that, you were wondering, oh my God, you know, that, 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 mm-hmm. that thankfully I wasn't, uh, I didn't see. So I was lucky there. Good. Was, did uh, the abuse crisis hit Ireland as well? Yeah. So that would have hit. So you have Bishop, the Bishop of Galway, Bishop, um, I forget the name is, I'm drawing a blank. The, when the Bishop of Galway, that scandal broke in the early 1990s, I'd say that was like the tipping uh, of the ice cream. And then some very serious sexual abuse scandals came out in Ireland. So it completely demolished the moral credibility of bishops and, uh, and, and of the church here. You know, if you're, if, especially when it came to the abortion referendum, bishops, you know, they were afraid to speak out about the truth because they say, oh, you don't come to us talking about, um, you know, the pro-life movement and look at how you've treated abuse victims and look at what priests have done and so forth. I mean, I the Irish church has suffered from, you know, decades of, of, uh, of cover up of bad formation and a very, very quickly changing culture, uh, the society that was moving on extremely fast. You know, the formation that people would have had in the 50, 40s, 50s, 60s. OK, it might have it might, you know, priests could have managed to 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 remain hidden in, in that type of environment. But when you're moving into the 1990s, 2000s, the era of the internet, mass media and stuff, there's nowhere to hide for these men anymore. And as soon as people started seeing the different stories of abuse came out, coming out, other victims said, well, look, that happened to him. Well, it happened to me as well. And a lot of people came out. So you had, you know, the, 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 this kind of tsunami of abuse cases in Ireland, which demolished the credibility of the Catholic church. And, um, and it's, it it's really it was the church's own own fault how they managed it how they covered up the formation process the people they were admitting to a seminary and it's still happening it's still happening connery you know there's there's a there's been a raft of of young priests in ireland and priests in recent years that you know have have come under scrutiny because they've gone through the seminary formation they shouldn't have been ordained they shouldn't have been admitted they weren't called to the priesthood and yet bishops you know don't seem to have learned the lesson that you uh, of past decades you, you, you know you need to have wow. good formation and you need to have men that are that are in there for the right reasons that uh, and that are not carrying baggage with them that is going to uh, you know weigh them down yeah didn't ireland only ordain like one priest this last year or is that no. uh uh, no, there's or been a few. Not? Yeah, okay. there's a few ordained. I mean, but it's it's in the low, it's in the low single digits at the moment. There, there, there's there's very very few vocations. Um, uh, I think last year, as far as I'm aware, they were asking va- um seminarians to be vaccinated for COVID, and and I, and I, I think that twenty percent of the men that were going to enter didn't or something like that. They 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 have um. And the the only seminary left in Ireland, and Maynooth has such a bad reputation that uh, you know a lot of men are going to uh, congregations or dioceses, or they're going out of Ireland. Traditional seminaries, traditional movement has a, has a, has quite a large number of seminarians at the moment. So yeah, it's, uh, you know, from they, Ireland. They, yeah, yeah. Is so, there uh, are there sort of a surprising number of? more traditional catholics in ireland or is it uh or is it a very small um i mean there's i did a survey a few years ago when i was looking at it there's about five thousand people that would go to that would go to traditional latin mass if it was available um and uh you know there there's different pockets and different groups uh around ireland um it's 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 uh, it's quite large uh, for for the the island it is, it, for our island, but it's a very very small percentage of Catholics, less than one percent of practice of 
of Catholics would would you could say are, are traditional Catholics in Ireland. That that's the, the what from what I can see anyway. Um, you know, approximately five thousand, but you know, five thousand which that love to faith. You know, with families and so forth, and uh, you know, not, very very good people to be honest, and uh, um, can do a lot of work in the church. Yes, and they are. I mean, good Catholics generally generally have more children, which leads yeah. to more Catholics. Yeah, uh, and yeah. then it's it you know, and pe- people are just having not enough children these days. So yeah. you know, the the Catholics that don't want anything to do with the church are going to die out because they don't have anyone to replace <laughs> them because they never had children. <laughs> Yeah, I suppose that that that's the irony of the the liberals. You know, they they're they're not leaving another generation. Maybe that's a good thing. Who knows? I don't know. It's a it's a kind of a strange thing in, in, in what's going on in 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 the world at this stage. But um, we just have to we just have to give um witness to our faith and the joy of of Catholicism and and try to help another generation. Yeah, it seems like Ireland was really built into sort of this politically liberal state uh sort of especially economically like it it is basically i believe it's a tax haven for many different corporations do you think that's driving a lot of the social changes in the 90s 2000 2010s no i don't i think it's um i think this was happening long before then so the roots go back uh the roots go back to the 1970s it's the changes, what the church did after Second Vatican Council. I'm not saying Second Vatican Council caused this. I'm just saying mm-hmm. what the church did. Uh, that that's really uh, you know because the, the the especially how the faith was taught. So what people fail to realize for generations, the faith would have been taught by religious, by priests, by nuns. You know, you had thousands of nuns in Ireland uh, at one stage, you know, and Christian brothers and priests uh, that did a lot of good work. I know there, there, you could say, look, there's about 5%, from what I could see, it's about 5% of them get all of the the noise for what they did. But there was a lot of them doing uh, really good work. And all of a sudden in Ireland, you had this in the 19, uh, towards the end of the 1970s or 1980s, by the end of the 1980s, you had practically the, the whole exit of religious from religious education in Ireland. So the nuns are gone, the, the Christian brothers, um, presentation brothers, uh, you had lots of the Dominicans, Jesuits and so forth, all of these orders that, that were that were teaching the faith. And what what you have to understood stood is, yeah, people would have been Catholic, but they didn't know how to teach the Catholic faith. And mm-hmm. what they were teaching was maybe a very devotional faith, let's say the Rosary and the Angelus. And, uh, you know, the devotion was was maintained, but actually you many Catholics were not actually able to explain what the Catholic Church actually taught, which was, uh, you know, the sad legacy uh, in Ireland. I, I say this because uh, you could you could see this um, with so many, you know, it's uh, they're not able to, they wouldn't be able to have you know, in a complete yeah. So you were you had the sexual revolution in Ireland, and you know a lot of Catholics weren't able to have a serious conversation about these uh, issues that were being uh, confronted with. and there was a lack of um, actually be able to teach the faith to to Catholics when, with the exit of all of the religious from education. So this is where the gap is in, in today, and and we see and you see it in in catholic education now is uh it's very very uh, it doesn't engage it doesn't engage the hearts and minds of catholics anymore in schools the schools here are catholic in name but not in practice they don't actually teach the faith and uh and the fruits are there you know especially after covid it's quite obvious you know the the catastrophic fall in mass attendance and uh, you know it's the, it, that that's there to be seen, and and you know it's 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 a hard thing to see what's happened uh, in the church. That and that that's my analysis on it. Um, so I don't think uh, obviously Ireland is. I think now we're now the richest per capita country in the world. You know the highest wages that you could get. 
but it's also it's also shown a lid on the spiritual poverty that many people are suffering the drugs that, that seems to be taking over the uh, all of these things that are destroying um, people's lives gambling drug addiction alcohol and so forth it's not making people happy it's not making them fulfilled you can have as much money as you like still not going to be happy um, if you don't if you're not rooted in something that's uh, profoundly that transcends this world which is you know the encounter with christ yeah so, yeah also to have ireland has a long history of being uh basically put down by yeah. their their uh british neighbors um do you think sort of success in some way success for the first time and for a long in a really long time might have a corrupting influence to say okay we don't need the church anymore because we've accomplished all of this economically and we've we've brought wealth in we've we've you know we've shown that that we're you know if you want to say we're better than the british or something like that like that might be the attitude or is that uh, um, not, not really a I mean, mentality ireland just handed oppression by britain to oppression by brussels <laughs> you know, we, we, we... <laughs> so we've 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 we're not sovereign we've never really been sovereign uh we've just you know joined we've left one union and rejoined another union and uh and uh it, it, a lot of our politicians just say oh no it's europe this europe that you know we we, we you know they, they 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 don't want to take responsibility it's which is fine for the moment because you know everything is going well and people have money but when a crisis hits i think ireland will be confronted with a lot of problems that they weren't expecting and you know with this rampant inflation it'll be interesting to see what happens in the next uh, two or three years um so i don't know we will see where it goes but yeah a lot of people think you know you know my life without God is fine and I don't need religion and I don't need a church. And um, that's, that's simply what many people are doing at the moment. They don't, they don't see a need for God in their lives. Um, and those that do look for something spiritual, you know, if there's a, a medium or a spiritual fair or something like that, or uh, they'll, they'll go to that or some new age stuff the catholicism doesn't speak to them as something serious that they need to embrace anymore yeah wasn't there recently some sort of a uh, scandal regarding like priests having um like yoga or something or uh, like um muslim something in their churches that happened at the beginning of the lockdown here in Mayo. So one priest allowed the call to prayer during mass in a, in the in a church here. So, yeah, I mean, we've seen all the crazy stuff going on, and you know, the church is in this experimentation phase of seeing, well, if things are not working. Let's 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 experiment a little bit more. And you just, wow. I suppose, we just have to let let them let them on with their experiment and see where where it'll head. Maybe they'll burn out uh in their experimentation i don't know it's it's kind of bizarre what's going on you just have to you just have to see what you know it'll, it'll we'll see where it heads anyway i i don't get involved in it because i i just couldn't uh face all of the the crazies sure. in the church yeah yeah no it makes sense and uh it's just interesting because a lot of conservative catholics in america basically look at the 80s and 90s or uh, as sort of the experimental uh and then the way they talk about it is if if the like experimenting is going away but it's n it's not really the case anywhere in the church that e experimentation is going away so it's this it, it's this weird like optimism that is yeah. somehow within uh a lot of conservative circles there, yeah. you know, and I think that's more based on their own experience. If they experience a, you know, the sort of the more traditional looking Novus Ordos, then they're going to feel, you know, feel like, oh, you know, the experimentation is done. We're getting through we're getting through the phase. Well, uh, it's hard to break time to break to you. It, that phase is not over. And yeah. it's. You know, it's it. Unfortunately, like you said, that it's they're going to be continuing their experimentation until someone tells them to stop. Yeah, and it really shouldn't be the laity say telling them to stop. It should be 
the bishops, it should be the Vatican, but they don't have an interest at the moment in doing so. Yeah, no, you look, as I said, you can kill spiritual truth, but it will resurrect. So you know, this is this is what the church needs, will will have to grapple with. And, um, you know, you just have to let the Holy Spirit in Christ um, work in his church and uh, move hearts and minds. Change only comes from the top. So it will be Rome that will sort this out at some stage. But, um, you know, I. I think I think the Pope has another. I don't know what vision the Pope has uh, in mind, <laughs> um, because it seems we can have a lot of uh, the, a lot of um, variations, but we don't seem to be able to allow you know the mass that was experienced uh, in Ireland fifty years ago uh, um, a location to to foster. So I don't know. I, I honestly don't know what's going on, but um, we just have to keep praying and not lose hope and not lose faith. Indeed. Uh, what is what is sort of the political situation in Ireland these days? Is there an opposition to these uh, political issues? Uh, no, no, no. So it's not like in America where you would have two polarized parties. Here in Ireland, pretty much every all parties practically sing from the same hymn, hymn sheet. There is, I mean, during the abortion referendum, there was a minority, um, as far as I'm aware, you know, fifteen percent of politicians were were pro-life um, and uh, it, it, we really didn't have that much support and even after the referendum some politicians who said they were pro-life suddenly became pro-choice and then voted oh. for legislation yeah yeah so uh, they, they changed wow. colors when when they saw the the wind was blowing and then they there were suddenly our local politician here he was pro-life and then he was pro-choice afterwards so um uh, yeah, it's it's not uh, Ireland's political um, system is, is is very very different and um uh, and you know it's just the 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 system that we have is is extremely is a lot different to America. We we have proportional representation. Um, uh, you know the 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 prime minister who would be the effective leader of Ireland. He's he's not voted for by the people. He's voted for by the parliament. So there's there's uh, differences, yeah. and you know it's um, yeah yeah. yeah. But, uh, the the differences of parliamentary system versus a um I don't even a republic I guess yeah um yeah, yeah it that's interesting. Is there just not enough people willing to run on uh, a Catholic platform? Does that just not exist? Or is there not I, enough I, pockets of Catholics like sort of uh, to yeah. link together to do something uh, about it? Yeah, I mean, it's it's the Irish are... I suppose I've lived outside of Ireland for so long. I can, I can see my own country from a different point of view. They... They don't. Um, as long as you've got your, if you've, if you're comfortable and you have your job and you have your, and your family's fine, then you, people just keep voting for the same people, and and, and uh, as long as uh, they vote for people that 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 give them tax decreases and you know look after the economy, that that's really where they go. They're not. They don't really care about. Catholicism, to be honest, and that's what I, the impression I'm getting. If the uh, faith is really secondary to me, to majority of Irish people, you know, otherwise why would you keep voting for these people? You know, they want a strong economy, their job, and their family looked after. They, their religion, the 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 religion of the the politicians and what they stand for for many Irish is, is secondary, uh, and that's the simple reality. Um, I can't think of any other reason. Yeah, that's just. Yeah, shame when you were uh when you were being taught the faith or when you were going to school uh with the nuns were they habited nuns or had they gotten rid of the habit so it was half and half some of them they were they were during this experimentation phase you know we're oh. going to go from from uh, from habit into nice nice uh you know pantsuits and st they were just exp you know this experimentation that pantsuits they right. I, don't Not even they were dresses? I don't they they one nun she was she was doing the whole fashion stage you know there was there were <laughs> there were she, 
was it a runway or something? Was I basically t- the school a runway? I, I just thought it was very bizarre. You know, you'd have some nuns, the elderly nuns, they would keep their habit and their veil. And, and other nuns, you know, they weren't doing that. They were dressing differently. So, I mean, uh, uh, and it's sad, that particular order, the Sisters of Mercy, they're, they're practically wiped out. You, they, they're, they're, there's very, very few in any active ministry anymore. I don't know what the church is going on about, you know, I don't, they seem to be afraid of showing their identity as, as clergy, as Catholics, as nuns. I don't know. I mean, I, a policeman, you can clearly identify who he is and what he does, but a religious Quite. these days, uh, you just, you would, you don't know what the, they seem to be. I don't know. It's, it's kind of bizarre. Blending um, in. Yeah. I mean, I used to, when I was a, when I was a leader in a crisis, religious, we, we used to all dress uh, with, with the, clergy collar uh so we would look like you would you you know with the clergy collar and a suit so even though i was never ordained a priest um people would stop me and say are you a father and i said no 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 i'm I'm just a religious brother and um but no cassock oh we had a cassock we always dressed we did we but we didn't we didn't wear it outside uh, our community we we would travel travel with the clergyman in a suit but in our community we wore we always wore a cassock um, and people would, you know, you, you generally they would stop you and ask you and strike up a conversation, um, you know, because you you could evangelize in that way. Whereas today, priests, you would, I've never, I've rarely have ever seen a nun in Ireland, and priests, unless you know that they're priests, you wouldn't. Sometimes you wouldn't know because a lot of them wouldn't dress, um, and that's okay. That's, but I do think there's a there's a message there for evangelization and, and showing your identity. Do you know, if we look yeah. at the, at the rate, at the LGBT movement, they're very, very good at showing their identity. We are this and you will, they'll make right. sure, you know, and yet like a Christ- vegan. Uh, yeah. I mean, uh, exactly. And yet also as Christians, as Catholics, for some bizarre reason, we, we want to hide our identity. Uh, and, and I don't know if, uh, if that's doing the the church any good or not, but it's yeah. interesting. Every yeah. five minutes, a vegan says, "I don't eat meat." You know that, right? <laughs> and it's like we don't care. Get on with you know, get on with what we're doing. Yeah, yeah. The, no, we, we. I had a daughter who went through the vegan phase, but it didn't last very long. Okay, um, <laughs> good. But uh, yeah, no, it's just it's it's just so depressing. I think Cardinal Seurat said you should be able to recognize a priest because it's like a doctor. If if you need spiritual help, you need to know where to go. And it's basically like if you're not wearing clericals, if a priest isn't wearing clericals, it's basically saying, I don't want to help. If, yeah. if you need help, uh, well, you won't find me. And yeah. I didn't tell you that, so it's not my fault. I mean, I, 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 I happened to see at mass in Knock a few months ago. There was two religious brothers in cassock, in the full cassock, and they were sitting in the middle of the congregation. Um, and in Ireland, for some strange reason, in the Novus Ordo, in some churches they don't know when to stand and sit. So they, in different places in Ireland, they they do the Novus Ordo very differently. So in one place they're standing when you should be kneeling, like. <laughs> in other places you're kneeling when you should be standing you, you know they were never taught in ireland how to the the novus order was actually never implemented correctly in ireland, <laughs> which is so know, embarrassing. yeah and knock is one of those typical places you know that uh, you know these these two brothers that that are not irish they they were following the novus order as the novus order had been taught so they were standing when they should be standing and uh, everybody behind them stood and everybody in front of them who didn't see them they were kneeling they were sitting down and like the brother's not sure do we stand do we sit and uh, it was it's amazing the example the two brothers gave to the people behind them because they were dressed as cast in cassocks and people said well they must know what they're yeah, doing we have to follow them <laughs> and they were actually following I, w- I was actually looking they're actually following the rubrics of the novus order correctly you know this is this you know in in the legions of christ we just took the novus order and followed it so whatever the vatican said to do 
that's what we did. That was it. Simple as there was no innovation. No, no. They even said it in Latin. So we just followed the The Pope says the Novus Order in Latin. We'll say it in Latin. That's what we did. Uh, so I, I kind of know the rubrics of the Novus Ordo Mise. And uh, in our, when you come to Ireland, oh, this chapel, oh, we're all kneeling down for the uh, for the at the start of the mass when you should be standing or in here you're all standing during the consecration when you should be kneeling but like <laughs> you just, you'd wonder where it's bizarre but like yeah that's just so bizarre you'd think you'd be in a different right or something because you know like uh you know the east has different uh different yeah. gestures that uh are more uh give more reverence to the yeah. situation versus the the western right where you know you know like kneeling is more um kneeling is very important in the western right while um Standing. i think i well, also i think um what is it uh laying fully um on the ground what is uh yeah. what's that called Postra it? yeah prostrating yeah prostration uh is very um much more important in the east so these different things, you know, uh, you you know, it looks like you're in a completely different. Uh, is this the northwestern uh, right or the or the north right? Is that a thing now? Uh, it, 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 my wife, who's Polish, you know, she 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 she, she just can't take the the Irish nobles order. She uh, says, "Look, you guys don't you don't want to do this." And it's 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 difficult for for um for anyone that's not familiar with the way things are done in Ireland. And and um, but anyway, look, uh, I think I think sooner or later the Irish Catholic uh, Catholics, especially the laity, will will kind of push things in a different direction, and um, we just have to. Uh, ride out this silly season in the church <laughs> it's just kind of a uh, strange time but um yeah i i think you should sh show your identity like you, you should be who you are you know the world is very focused on identity and yet the church doesn't seem to care which i think is the church doesn't know its identity it doesn't know uh, uh, it doesn't sons and daughters of god that that's yeah. the identity yeah, yeah, get exactly. that through your head, church. Yeah. That's what's going on. You need to yeah. uh, you need to take that and follow that and be th that uh, in which you are. Yeah, um, exactly. and that's all that matters. Yeah. Um. But yeah, no. So, do you think the internet? Do you think the sort of this movement of having more evangelization over YouTube and other platforms is helping Ireland or it is giving maybe a boost to maybe help the laity in Ireland uh drive yeah. you know in the uh, in a different direction the way you're talking about um i just fell into this really by accident i never envisaged um to be in this space but the amount of people that reached out to me around ireland uh you know i kind of been overwhelmed uh you know just just and it kind of got me thinking a lot more about my faith, you know, try to study it a bit more, try to give a, a message that's positive, because there's a lot of commentators, especially in the US, uh, the, you know, and let's be clear, a lot, a lot of Catholics in Ireland are very much influenced by American YouTubers. OK, Taylor Marshall and and the mm -hmm. likes of uh, Bishop Barron, uh, Father Mike Schmitz, all of these. And um you know, some of them are really, really good content. Taylor Marshall started off really good. He was helping a lot. And then he became, in the last four years, he became kind of a different person. And uh, and and a kind of, and I'm not criticizing him, I'm just saying, I, I think it'd be, it's, 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 it's good if we could just focus on what is going to form people in the faith and give them a bit of, you know, show them the joy of what it is to be Catholic. That it's not yeah, just drab and depressing. That positive... And, yeah, that we have to be part. positive. Yeah, exactly. People shouldn't be afraid. Don't be afraid. Don't despair. Don't let the confusion in the church destroy your relationship with Christ. You know, uh, that he wants your heart and your soul. He wants you engaged with him. That's where we, we need to go. So it's great when I see your channel and, and other people doing this. Because this dialogue, this conversation is actually what people are looking for. They, mm -hmm. Everybody said it on my channel. We want We want more conversations. Because then they see the conversations we're having, said, "Oh, is this what people are talking about?" Well, let's let's expand this conversation in the church on the faith, 
And that's what we need to drive. Um, my daughter said like she be she was listening to a lot of um, Peter Jordanson and Joe Rogan, you know, all of those long form podcasters. And she said mm-hmm. she loved that. She was she, since she was 16. And I think that's what, you know, Catholics want to hear is your experience of the faith, your love for the faith, you know, um, uh, and this is this is what uh, I think will, will drive consciousness of where we need to go in the church uh, and and. Bishops and priests will listen to us, Connor. They will listen to us slowly. The future bishops and priests might listen to us. The people that are listening to you today in the future could be bishops and priests and take a different view on how we form the faith and how we reverence the Eucharist. You know, we don't need to make it a dance show or performance. <laughs> I mean, we 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 had we our our the Archbishop of Ireland, the Archbishop of Armagh at Christmas this year. Christmas midnight mass. He had he had six girls dancing around him at the altar. Uh, you know, <laughs> you know, oh it wasn't my. even under there was no gender balance. He didn't have three boys or, or three girls. It was all he he happened to have the women dancing around him. Um and, I mean, come on, guys. I you know the, the this is uh have we not learned yet? it's it's innovation after innovation look it didn't work the mass we're not getting viewers so let's let's rev it up a little bit you know that's not the mass that's not the mass that's not worship that's not giving praise and worship to christ and something else mass. yeah guys so look it's as i said it's you know it's a uh, lack of formation and um and uh, a lack of reverence for you know who's been sacrificed in that altar and um, you know we just have to see where where this all goes out. It's an ex- we're all in this experimentation phase. So you know this is what bishops are. Rome seems to be allowing this to happen. And uh, I don't know. It's it's we'll see where 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 it all ends up. Yeah, God's got a plan for us. And I do want to say that I do like uh, what Taylor Marshall has done for the most part. Uh, I think. I think the ex- ultra negative turns me off a decent amount and it's not really necessarily a criticism of him necessarily. It's just more of what I'm interested in. I'm more, I really like, you know, of YouTubers, you know, um, out, you know, outside of this conversation, uh, Matt Frad really does a great job of, you know, sort of bringing a combination of the hard hitting truth as well as, you know, really positive discussions of really important subjects. And I think the reason people really like listening to long form discussions is because they don't get to participate in real life. (laughs) They they don't know how to have these types of discussions with anybody around them. It baffles me. You know, it uh, doesn't make any sense to me, but it's like, especially my generation are, the communication skills are basically dead. They, <laughs> they do not have any ability to communicate, not with each other, not with their, not with adults, not with anyone. They are basically just trying to survive. Yeah. It's a Snapchat generation. You see, it's the, and my kids hate it when I criticize uh, <laughs> the, the, they're living in the phones, but um. This is why faith formation needs to be taken out of the schools and we actually need to meet face to face and talk about the faith. You know, we need to bring our our communities together. I nearly say any kids being prepared for for first communion, you should have the parents there during catechism class, you know, have them all there, you know, bring 20 kids and 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 on their parents there and, and discuss the faith in a in a community, uh, pray together talk about the faith and if parents are not willing to do that if the parents are not willing to bring their kids to faith formation if they're not engaged with the church maybe it's it's okay to say to them that's okay we respect your decision if you're not interested in what the church is offering okay you know that's your decision but those who do want to engage we need to catechize them and form them and bring them in the church i mean the, the, this it's crazy we have turned religion into a subject in our Catholic school, Catholic schools in mm-hmm. Ireland. We've turned it into a subject, and that's how they see it. Daddy, I have to I have to study religion. No, religion isn't to be studied. Religion or the faith is to be loved. So you're passing something on that's most precious 
that you love them immensely, you're passing that on to the next generation. Faith should never be taught. And people might say, oh, that's you're saying it wrong. Wherever you, of course, we teach the faith. Yes, you teach the faith. But the starting point is you show them the love you have for something and then you expose them to that love, to that to that precious gift. And you open up the universe of the faith, you know, opening up an encounter with Christ in the Eucharist. I mean, this is where we need to go. And uh, this is the new generation. We need to get them off phones. We need to bring them into communities and to talk. I mean, you every every Catholic community should be meeting two to three times a week. I mean, we I, I do. I, I, I would re- meet with a group of people. We would have a prayer, rosary, we would meet face to face and talk it out. And, uh, you know, then during the week, you know, it's all Snapchat. Can you pray for this? Can you do that? Mm-hmm. We all we'd we'd always be in contact, ringing each other up, support them if there's something that people need. Um, but uh, that's that's how you live the faith. You know, Christ said it himself. We're two or three of God's name. I'm there amongst them. So we're missing a whole dimension of our Catholic faith if we're just focusing on a Sunday mass. That's so empty. I mean, if some of the, some of the Novus Ordo misses that we go to are so empty, that there's no community. Uh, all during COVID, people fail to realize we are actually baptized brothers and sisters. You're my baptized brother in Christ. And as a family, how do you treat family? Not as somebody diff- distant that you never talk to. You have to face them face to face, talk to them and, you know, encounter Christ in your family because Christ is there. This is what we need to do. We need to get this out into the church um, and the traditional communities get it really well. They know they form beautiful communities. I saw that with the societies of Pius X. They always had um, a community encounter after mass. Beautiful communities. I know people criticize them, and you know we can debate about canonical stages and what Pope Francis is doing with them. But they they have beautiful communities, and they love the faith. They really do. I mean, and you, I've seen this with, with many traditional groups, whereas us Novus Ordo Catholics don't seem to be able to talk about our Catholic. It's, it's simply it's 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 bizarre what, the way it's going on. Um, yeah. I did. Yeah, it's I don't know. Yeah, no, it's, it is. It is bizarre. I had this kind of conversation uh, about catechesis with Dr. Jared Stout on one of my episodes uh, previously, and he really hit he's really hitting on uh, exactly what you're talking about. You know, he basically says that in school, in the classroom, religion education is basically useless and has never has never been effective. And we've known this for a really long time, but no one ever wants to change it because that's too much work or I don't I don't want to change this or it makes it look like I, I'm not doing my job if you're if you're a religious education teacher. You know, it makes you look like, uh, you know, if you can't get if you would get more people to come to the classes than you would to get people to come to, you know, something else uh, that's more yeah. that's, uh, more um, sort of holistic and more, um, you know, getting people to participate in their faith instead of just, you know, at a desk being like, oh, that that this is the answer uh mm-hmm. you know or a lecture or whatever because that's not encounter encounter is how you learn your faith or how you participate in your faith not this some uh you know this classroom question and answer format it's crazy i mean it's uh i mean we're forming we have formed i mean we're now in the second generation of this you know my kids have come through secondary school so we've we're the second generation of irish catholics that haven't been taught the faith it is and it's quite obvious i mean the demographics are there in ireland i mean the novus ordo uh, parishes as i would say your ordinary parish in ireland you know it is what it is in many places there are some good priests in ireland you know really good priests that are that are trying their best that are that are working in their communities but um uh, I could see it here in my local parish after COVID. Quite obvious. I mean, you see it with the empty car park. That's where you see it. I remember. I said you could see it in the car park. It's uh, uh, and there is no community. There is no faith community. Um, you know, and that might sound very hard to some people, but uh, it's it's disjointed. It's um, you know, it's 
uh, it's not engaging a whole generation of young in the faith and, and and that's very very sad so you know we just have to pray and let's hope that that uh the, somebody will see sense yeah do you think things are getting better in ireland or are they getting worse do you think uh, from the f- point of view of the faith there are some good um there are some good groups in ireland you know really really good groups different groups that are that are kind of working you know below the radar i saw it during covid because there was some priest that would say mass that could change the same mass during covid under the radar you know secretly so there was there there is a lot of faith and you know christ has purified his church because those who have come back after covid when you know they love the faith so there you know there there are some good pockets and you know we just have to let the holy spirit christ work in his church and uh you know it's not about us seeing results because it's not about me you know let what what does christ want uh, and he'll work through and uh you know you, you don't know what's going to happen in the future so yeah I, I i i've seen a lot of good people a lot of good groups in ireland um but i we could do more with the, the amount of resources we have you know we could do more um, and and that's really kind of interesting. I mean, if you think about it, I set up my blog. People think that I'm doing it full time and I'm spending a half an hour, an hour a day. And, uh, you know, the amount of people reaching out and commenting and, and, and questioning. And I'm saying, look, if I'm doing this half an hour a day, that people, why aren't people that, that love the faith, that have the time? I mean, you could be doing so much more <laughs> with this in the church, you know, which I find quite, quite sad in a way. Do you know that... Uh, a married man in his free time in the evening is putting up something and it's getting such reach. I'm not a theologian. People are giving their life to the faith. They have more time. You can walk. You can do this. You can probably do it a million times better than me. And, and, you know, get that out, get that message out into the church. You know, we need to renew. We need, we need to show our love for the faith and, and, and so forth. And uh, let's see what happens. Well, I think it's obvious that God chose you for uh for a specific reason. Uh so yeah. uh and we might not know that for a while or you know. Yeah, uh, he must have he must have lost his glasses that day. <laughs> <laughs> what? No, excuse what? me? No. Oops. That was you? Oh, not oh, no. him. <laughs> no, I think I think God knows what He's doing with you. Uh, so, and oh it, gosh. it's a, it's a blessing to have uh well you on, and uh, I'm grateful. I think it was uh Anthony Stein from Return to Tradition that suggested uh yeah. the two of us should talk about Ireland uh together. So, uh, yeah. thank you to him uh for uh for helping us uh connect i mean we knew who each other were and we'd been following each other but uh you know that was the that was the nudge that uh <laughs> got us to talk yeah. um so no. but yeah, no, it, yeah yeah so uh is there anything uh before we wrap, wrap it up no i'm just delighted with your work and um and i'm hoping that i'll, I'll share this when you publish it on your channel i'll share it with uh, people and hopefully they can uh, follow your work and um you know i i offer you all the encouragement and prayers that i can i just think you're 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 definitely doing something amazing for the church by by driving the conversation and uh, which is important thank you i'll be praying for you as well um thanks very much but uh if if you guys i mean the odds of my listeners not knowing who who you are uh is very small i think but if you if they haven't please check out uh please check out his channel i will link that in the description so people who watch it watch this episode will be able to find you so but you know uh you're doing a wonderful job and i really enjoy your content as well so uh please like share and subscribe And have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye. Bye.